All right, guys, we'll get started here, and uh, it's, good to, it's good to have you guys here this evening. I tell you what, we need to open in prayer, don't we, before we, before we come around the wood. Um, Lord, we thank you this evening for bringing us together, and we're grateful, Lord, for being together tonight, just to break open your word, and uh, Father, as we break open your word, we ask that you would break open your word to us and that you would give us understanding of what we are going to be covering here this evening. We thank you for this book of Psalms. We thank you for each Psalm that we have covered so far. And we are uh, blessed to cover Psalm 24. And we ask a blessing upon this Psalm that you would uh, bless it to our hearts and give us understanding this evening. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Psalm 24. And Psalm 24 is called by many as the Psalm of Ascension. And so um, this is indeed what we're going to be looking at tonight, is the Psalm of Ascension. And I'll explain to you, if you don't know what that is, what that is. Um, David wrote Psalm 24, and Mount Zion was the worship center for Israel during his reign. Uh, Jerusalem was, was up high, and so whenever they would go to worship, they would have to ascend, because Jerusalem is in a high place. But we believe there's a deeper truth here, because when, after our Lord had risen from the dead, and after he had given instruction to the disciples, speaking of them at the kingdom of God for 40 days, uh, when that 40 day period was up, they watched Jesus ascend into heaven. And so we believe that Psalm 24 is really about Jesus. It's really about Jesus Christ. And it's really about how he ascended into the heavens as our high priest. And so this is good news for us tonight, that the one we are trusting in is seated at the right hand of the Father, and the scripture tells us he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, as we go to Psalm 24 here, I must confess that the first two verses, I never really got the connection. It's like I'm reading Psalm 24, and verse 1 and 2 <clears throat> never seem to make a connection for me with this whole ascension issue until tonight. So as I'm reading this, it says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. What is... what? What it's talking about is the Lord's sovereign control, that everything is his by ownership because he created it, he made it. And even since the fall, creation is still his. Human beings are still his. Even those who don't want to be his, they're still his. He created them. He has rights over them. He has ownership over them. And so the Psalm of Ascension is covering the fact that this sovereign Lord is in the highest place. He ascended into the highest realm, and he's sovereignly Lord over all creation. The Bible clearly tells us that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we know that that passage in Philippians isn't just talking about believers. It's talking about unbelievers and even demonic forces as well. Because it tells us that um, things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth, everything will bow the knee to Jesus because he's Lord. Now, there are teachings out there that falsely claim that when Adam and Eve fell, the world became Satan's. Has anyone ever heard that teaching? 
It's false, by the way. Uh, the world does not belong to Satan. Now, he has been given permission as the God of this age to be able to run the show to a certain degree. Um, this fallen world is basically following his, following his directions. Uh, sinful human nature is in agreement with, with satanic desires that uh, human beings really don't want God. So there is indeed a rebellion afoot. But even in the fallen condition of this world, God is sovereign even over all of that. Amen? Amen. Now, he doesn't approve of it, but he's sovereign over every issue. The Bible also says he removes kings and raises up kings. Now, last time I checked, the governments of this world aren't particularly holy, but he's still in charge isn't he? And for the Christian, that's where we get peace, because we understand that whoever is put in office is put in office by his sovereignty, and he has a plan, he has a purpose. On occasion, we encounter Christians who deny the sovereignty of God. There are professing Christians who don't believe in the sovereignty of God. Now, if you're embracing that thought that God is not sovereign, then how can you even sleep at night with what's going on in our world currently and even in our nation currently? The reason why we can sleep is, is because the earth is the Lord's. It belongs to him and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. So not only the physical things of this world, the material things, things of this world, but according to this passage, even all the people are under his sovereignty and ultimately belong to him. Now, of course, there's a distinction. There are those who are the children of God. There are those who are his through redemption. But everyone from a creation standpoint belongs to God. Yep. And that's why even people who might deny him all their life, will one day still have to give account to him and stand at the judgment seat of Christ. They all will. So the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the river. So it's his because he created it. It's his because he designed it. Even though the fall did take place, it's still his. Now, now, this is something that might blow our mind. God permitted the fall to happen. It, it wasn't outside of his knowledge, outside of his scope. As soon as he put two trees in paradise, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he was already allowing that choice to happen. He commanded them, do not eat, right? And Adam and Eve... Unlike you and I, they were actually sinless. They had no sin nature. They were created innocent and with a righteousness that was unblemished by, by human decision. It was unblemished by human decision. And it would seem that all human decision transcends or descends into rebellion is, is all that human decision seems to do. So, um, so Psalm 24, now, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In my margin, it's got and all that fills it, and all that fills it. So God created it all. Every human being is subject to him, and every human being must give account to him one of these days. Now, if you and I were, are called to give account to God apart from Jesus Christ, what a scary proposition that would be. Because now is our opportunity to receive Christ, to receive what he did for us on that cross. 
Because the only way that you and I are going to escape the judgment of God from a negative standpoint is through Jesus Christ. Outside of him, there is no escape. He's the only way. He's the only way through. So Psalm 24, 1 and 2, the sovereignty of God, and he has in mind the creator, the one who created it all. And so it's, it's his because he gave it all life. And it's all going back to him one of these days. Now, I want to look at some passages here that produce the evidence that everything belongs to God. Because, again, there are people that will deny the sovereignty of God, even professing Christians. And um, it's their way of trying to reconcile the reason why there's bad in the world. And they try to defend God from a weak position by saying, well... Uh, basically, God is not sovereign, and he's given human beings the sovereignty of human decision. And because of that, you know, there's nothing God can do. His hands are tied. And, and that's not true, by the way. Amen. It's not true. And there's verses everywhere that, that, that prove that. Now, the balance is this, that if, if, you, if you reject Christ then that indeed is a decision from your heart. That's a choice from your heart. And it's an eternal choice that will uh, destroy your soul for all eternity. And so, yes, there is a certain element involved in, in human decision. But human decision does not control God and does not... Um, Deny God. It's not stronger than God, is what we're saying. Now, Exodus 19, verse 5, God chose Israel. Now, if I was to ask you, why did God choose Israel? Could you come up with a reason why? All right, but why did God choose Abraham? Go ahead. There are stiff-necked people. There are stiff-necked people. Okay, is, is that a good quality or a, or a bad quality, Matthew? Amen. Weren't they just I agree. They were a small nation. Yes. Good. That's another excellent point. So he chose them to show his glory through them, perhaps, because they were a small nation. And for them to become a mighty nation was an evidence of God's power. But when we look at the choosing of God, the choosing of Israel, and I like the reply because he wanted to. <laughs> Uh, um, because he's sovereign, right? Yep. I mean, God can choose whatever he wants. And unlike me, his choices are perfect. His choices are not tainted by sin or selfishness like I am. Um, here's, here's a thought. Um, God does have the freedom to choose. And, you know, to a certain degree, he's given us a freedom to choose as well. Um, but obviously, there's only one who's completely free to choose whatever he wants. Well, we can only choose sin, though. That's... It would seem that way, apart from his grace. Yeah. Apart we have from... to have some good in us yeah. lost to yeah. choose any good, and we don't. Yeah. We're completely depraved. Yeah. But God, God chose us or chose people in and made decisions and put things in motion to demonstrate who he is to all of creation. Yeah. That's the whole purpose. So yeah. keeping that in mind, that's why all these things are set in motion. That's why he chose Israel, to yeah. demonstrate who he is, Yeah. to show all of his attributes. There is, there is such a thing called common grace, yeah. where God is good to all, even to people who hate him. The Lord is good to them. That's grace. You know, atheists, some atheists who hate God, they've, they've lived a long time. Do you know that? They've lived a long life. And they've even been relatively successful. But you know what? It's not this, it's not this life that counts. It's the one that's coming that really counts. 
because you can be the most successful person on the planet. But Jesus said, what does it profit the man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If, even if a person could have great riches um, and yet reject Christ, those riches are temporary. Now, there's nothing wrong in being rich. Nothing wrong at all. In fact, that may even be, a, in fact, not may, that's a blessing from God, right? If God has enriched us materially, physically, there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem that we often have is our hearts towards it. You know, we, and, and not just with that, but with, with, with lots of things. As, as human beings, we're always putting things in front of God. It might be a relationship. It might be someone you love that you're putting in front of Jesus Christ. And, you know, because we all have that tendency to do that, whatever it might be. But our God is good tonight. Um, he wants to free us from putting other things in front of him. And there is real freedom when he frees us from doing that. Because then you can enjoy what God's blessed you with correctly. Because if you enjoy it more than him, there's always that thing in the back of your mind thinking, I could lose this in a moment. But the reason why the joy that God gives us is unlike any other joy is because we know we're not going to lose him. And so... Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The greatest commandment. And the second, love thy neighbor as thyself. But you aren't going to do the second without doing the first. And by the way, none of us can do the first command in a perfect way. We all break that command. If we could fulfill that command, we would be keeping the whole law. But there is one that did, and his name is Jesus now let's look at this, Exodus 19, verse 5. God speaking to Israel. Have you ever asked yourself the question, God, why did you save me? You know, have you ever looked at yourself and wondered, God, why me? Why did you save me? And if you're trying to look for reasons like, well, maybe you saved me because I was better than that person down the street. When you start looking for human reasons why God saved you, you're not going to find the reason in that. The only reason you can find is God himself, the goodness of who God is, the graciousness of our God, and that will be the only thing that will give you any kind of answer as to why God saved you. Now, I got a verse for that, actually. Yes, please, share it. If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath on the unrighteous is he... Uh, may it never be, for otherwise, how will God judge the world? So basically he's saying that our unrighteousness mm -hmm. and the unrighteousness of, uh, 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 shows how righteous God is. Yes. It shows, it shows who he is. Grace. Yep. Grace. And um, amen to that. Now Exodus 19.5, he says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice. This was given to Israel, by the way. They had a great opportunity here. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now, the last part, for all the earth is mine, we can see because all the earth is his, he has the right to choose who he wants. If it all belongs to him anyway through creation, then he has the right to pick Israel. Now, let me remind you that just because things were going for a different time historically, the Bible tells us, in fact, Paul, writing about the Jews, he says the gifts and the callings of God are given without repentance. And so Paul is finding great comfort that though many were rejecting Christ to the damnation of their souls, there would still be a plan for Israel in the heart of God. Because once he sets his heart upon a people, he does not take his heart away. 
Unless you believe election can be undone. Now, if you believe election can be undone, then we can undo the whole Bible. <laughs> you know, so uh, no, because God don't make mistakes. When God chooses, when God elects, he does it with, with complete foreknowledge, complete foreknowing, complete power to be able to perform what he has chosen, even though we might fail. That would make God a liar. It, indeed. And it would make him kind of hit and miss that, you know, very inconsistent, you know. Um, but like you said, let God be true, but every man a liar. Shall our unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? May it never be. It doesn't change who God is. And let's not forget, it's still grace. And so God will bring these people in. In the, in the last days, many of them anyway. Though many of them have been lost, unfortunately, God is going to bring them in by his grace. Now, um, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14, is another passage here. And it says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, whatever that is. Well, that's where God dwells, the heaven of heavens. I've never been there, but it all belongs to God, the highest place. Now, notice this next comment, the earth with all that is in it. Now, we have to be honest, not everything in the earth is good, right? We're not living in a pleasant world right now, and... We, we think of how things is, but it all belongs to God. By creation, by design, and it's all going back to God. And it all will give account to God in one way or another. The Bible tells us that the body shall return to the dust from whence it came, but the spirit will return back to God who gave it, book of Ecclesiastes. So it's, it all belongs to God. Even that body that's in the dust, it belongs to God. In fact, the scripture says he's going to raise it up from the dead. Now, I used to think that the resurrection was only for the just. But did you realize it's also for the unjust? There will be a resurrection of the just? And the unjust, which I think is pretty incredible. So all those atheists who have denied the resurrection, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be resurrected. And they're going to have to stand before God. And our prayer before death is that people turn now, come back to God now, the only reason why God is permitting the blasphemer to continue is because he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn and repent. And he exhorts them to do that. And so common grace extends God's grace because often we wonder why when people blaspheme his name, lightning doesn't come down and strike them immediately and kill them right away. It's because our God is a gracious God. He's gracious to the just and to the unjust. He's gracious to all. But only the redeemed will get the saving grace, and that's the difference. And the reason why he extends his common grace is so that saving grace can potentially happen. 2 Peter 3.9 He's long suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is our only hope. And by repentance, we're talking about turning to God, turning towards God, bringing our sins to God, seeking to turn away from our sins with God's power, God's help acknowledging and agreeing with God in reference to our sins and crying out to him that he might save us is our only option right now. 
So, the earth with all that is in it. Now, in Psalm 50, verse 12, the reason why God says this is because around them, there were people um, offering uh, food to their false gods, and uh, they thought that as they offered food to their false gods, their gods needed these to eat, you know. And the Lord says this, he said, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all its fullness are mine. It all belongs to me, he's saying. Psalm 89, verse 11, another one here. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it, you have founded them. Now, before we move on, I'll give you one more verse on this. Jeremiah 32, 27. If that's the case tonight, then you and I have a sovereign God who is not limited by anything. He can cause and make his power known. You see, if God was limited by people, then he would no longer be sovereign. It's a mystery to us that even when people are acting in rebellion against him, he is bringing about his plan and purpose and even using that person's rebellion to bring about his plan. Think about it. I'll give you one example. Judas Iscariot. Did he not fulfill scripture? Yet he was in direct rebellion against God. But uh, he wasn't a willing participant in reference to doing God's plan. But he was trying to, he was an instrument of Satan. Satan entered his heart, Scripture says. Go ahead. When he's talking about re repentance there, that's an interesting thing with Judas. Yeah. He didn't repent, yeah. but he may very well have been sorry for what he did. He was. Yeah. You regretted that. You know, sorry, being sorry for your sin... Yeah. Yep. No, I agree. There's a very close connection with the Greek word for repentance and the Greek word for regret. Um, the, uh, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia, but the Greek word for the regret that Judas was showing was metalamoni. It kind of begins with the same four, same four words. Of four letters, meta. And so he looked at it and regretted it. And he, he was just regretting the outcome. He wasn't regretting it because of the, you know, because he had sinned against God. He was regretting it for his own loss. So the consequences. Yeah, the consequences, like I got caught type thing. And so, but it's interesting that the both Greek words are closer to one another in reference to repentance and false repentance. And there was another man by the name of Esau who wept bitterly, you know, after he lost what was rightfully his because he didn't value it, didn't treasure it. And I believe the same kind of sorrow that Esau had was the same kind of sorrow that Judas Iscariot had. In fact, Scripture said he sought repentance and didn't find it, Esau, though he sought it bitterly with tears. Now, the reason behind him why he didn't find it was because his whole motivations were wrong anyway. They were all self-centered, and he felt sorry for himself and his own losses. Rather than truly repenting for the bad attitude in his life towards God, you know, um, so, you know, I do believe the closest relation we have to those two words in our current church environment is the difference between making penance and repentance. Because when we do penance, we're trying to pay for our forgiveness and we're trying to do what's right to get forgiven when the basis of our forgiveness is not what we have done, but what Christ has done. Based on mercy and grace. Amen. And there's a difference there. 
And even though, you know, I've never been in a system that's, that's uh, on, on a personal level that's um, done that worship of penance, it's human nature to want to do it that way, isn't it? So we do things to try and make up for the bad we've done. That's why all the world's false religions teach to, to work and earn your salvation. Amen. Or earn your favor with God versus just relying on Christ and his mercy. In fact, let's go to Romans. I have to go to Romans here. And this is a little trail, but I think it's very important. Romans chapter 4. Keep in mind what's just been said about that. And maybe Romans 4 might make more sense to us. Because there comes a point in your life when you realize, even if you did all these great works, even if you could and do all these great deeds, it would not be enough to gain you forgiveness before God. If it could, then what Jesus did for you would be irrelevant. It would be inconsequential. The reason why what Jesus did for you, dying for you on that cross, bearing the penalty of your sin, is because there was nothing that you could do to pay the price for yourself. So Jesus paid it all because he was the only one that could pay it all. So our forgiveness is based on faith in Christ and faith in his work, not our own. And there has to be a true evaluation of our true nature in order for us to be able to embrace this. Now, here, uh, Romans 4 and verse 4. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So it changes the whole nature of the righteousness that the believer receives. Because if our righteousness was based on what we have done, then it would no longer be a gift, but it would be our due. Like working all the day, you know, in your job, and you expect, you know, let's be realistic. I know you've worked with some people, and when they get a paycheck, it's like robbery because they've done nothing all week long. But... Beside that point, when you work, you do get a paycheck at the end of the week. But this is not based on our works. And this is why he's declaring it this way. He says, now to the one who works. Yeah, we read that. But verse 4, or verse 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted as righteousness. Isn't that good news? So it wasn't based on your work. It was based on his finished work. When Christ's final words were, it is finished, what he's saying is, I paid the price. I've done what the Father wanted me to do. I've completed it. It's paid in full. But when religions try and tell you, you've got to do it all, then it completely denies the finished work of Christ and undermines it. Well, the issue is, is that when we try to work our way or, or earn favor with God for our sin against Him, yeah. we don't, we're putting God down at a lower level than what He is. That's He's right. an eternal God, and when we sin against Him, yeah. our punishment is eternity. That's and, right. Because right? He's an infinite and so, God. Because He's infinite, right? So we're sinning against an infinite God, holy God, eternal God. Yeah. The punishment is infinite, eternal. And that's why an infinite, eternal God had to die to pay for our sins. He paid the price. He's the only one that could. His work was enough. Amen. He was the only one who could. And we never could. We, couldn't, we could never pay, pay for one sin, let alone the rest, the whole, our whole life of sin. Pastor, may I read real quick here, just in the King James in verse 4. I think it's, sure. I think it says it really well. It says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckon of grace, but of debt. Mm. Oh, amen. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. It's like, That's better. Yeah, I agree with yes. you. That's why I still read the King James, by the way. 
along with my ESV and New American. But um, basically, that that good work is you should be doing. That's yeah. what you should be doing. Yeah. So it can't pay for no. the debt that's owed. Well, you're yes. not you're not relying on grace. Yeah. You're relying on your own work, which puts you farther in debt. Yeah. That's right, because you fail to do it anyway. <laughs> Now, verse 6, it says, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. So it wasn't our works that brought us to this point of being declared righteous by God. It was God's finished work, what he did on that cross for you. And when you receive what he did for you on that cross and you put your whole trust in him, and you give up on your own way. And you realize, no, only the cross can purchase this kind of forgiveness where God can say, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Because Christ was punished for you, and, you're, and you receive that reality, then that means your punishment is gone. Because your punishment landed on him. And that's why you're not going to get eternally punished. Now, as believers, we have seen that, that if we do sin, we get disciplined by the Lord, but that's not punishment. Punishment is different to discipline. Discipline is all designed by God for our good and for our spiritual growth. So even that, it's like having a child that you have to correct. You love them, but you correct them not to destroy them, but that they learn the right way to go. So yeah, there's still discipline if we as believers step out of line and God disciplines us. But as far as your eternity goes, that should be a settled issue. That should be done. And if it's not done in your mind, and if it's not finished in your thinking, then you are undermining Christ's finished work. And you still don't realize the fullness of what he did for you. So he said, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now that's shouting ground. <laughs> yep. And the reason why he does not count your sin against you is because your sins were counted against Christ. Yep. That's why. And so that's our means of deliverance right there. Lord, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, because Christ has been condemned in our place. Can we look at the negative on that in verse 7 and 8, though? Cursed, Cursed are those whose lawless deeds have not been forgiven. Yeah. Cursed is the man whose sin the Lord will take unto account. Yeah. I think that's another aspect of reading that. Yeah. Without the Lord... And without receiving his finished work, there is no means of deliverance or salvation. Um, amen. So we go to Jeremiah here before we get back to Psalm 24. Uh, but the Lord says this. He says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And by all flesh, he's not just referring to redeemed flesh. He's referring to the ungodly. He's referring to the wicked. He says, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And then he asks us a rhetorical question because there's only one way you can answer this question. Is anything too hard for me? Well, after that, we got to say, no, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. I might be a difficult case. And I might be difficult to deal with, but I'm not too hard for you, Lord. And you've not given up on me. And because you've not given up on me, I will not give up on myself because I know I have my hope in you. And you're going to finish what you have begun. Now, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. It's, it's quoted in one place in the New Testament. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 25 and 26. And it's used in reference to not feeling bad about what you eat or don't eat, you know, because there are some people in Paul's day who, well, the problem they had was they would buy meat at the market 
and they were curious whether that animal had been sacrificed to a pagan god. And so they were worried about that. Some of the weaker conscience Christians were. And Paul was trying to reassure them. It's like, it belongs to God anyway. Even though that animal might have been used in a pagan ritual, sacrifice and was slain, you can still eat the meat because it, it was God who created it. It doesn't belong to that pagan God. It belongs to God himself. This is where I think to, to use a, an illustration uh, to bring it down to our level, very often you get people that get involved in cancel culture, don't you? You get people who say, and I'm not saying this is true, I'm just using this as a reference. Well, Walmart's a really bad place, you know, it's owned by wicked people. That might be true, it might not be true. <laughs> Or, you know, they might be involved in some kind of false religion, so I'm not going to shop at that store. Well, regardless of whether you shop at that store or not, the bacon was created by God, <laughs> you know. I mean, obviously it's been improved upon, you know, through human, human smoking and all of that. But regardless of where you buy your food from, uh, it, it ultimately all belongs to God. That's why I don't get into the cancel culture, you know? Because if you got into the cancel culture, you'd never eat anywhere again, you know? And, and it's ridiculous, it's silly, because we're also called as Christians to be the lights in the world, and you're called to shine that light in a dark place. That's why I'm opposed to cancel culture. I don't get it because it all ultimately comes from God anyway, right? So, now I know I have a friend here who has vowed never to go back to California until it straightens itself out. And, you know, I, I understand that. That's a personal conviction. And I don't think that person has gone back there since the early 80s. And so, it's not gotten any better, that's all we can say. Um, those of us who have been to California, although we do pray for the state of California. But here's a thought. California still belongs to God. Amen. It's his by creation, his by design. Now, the philosophies aren't good, but it all still sovereignly belongs to God. Right? He may not approve of, of the laws being passed and the governments in office, but his, his, his word, he's, he put them in that position. He has a purpose, whatever it is. And so that's why we can sleep at night. Um, so, yeah, don't become my friend too closely. You might become a topic in my sermon. So, but I'll try not to mention you by name. It's terrible for pastors' families, you know, when they become a topical issue during the sermon. But let's read this. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's liberating. That's freeing, you know. So on that score, I can still eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. That's one thought. But anyway, although I try not to eat too much of it because it really sits on you after a while. I, I eat the small containers now. It was, it was the big leader ones before, but boy, does it change, change how you look. Or how your pants fit. Yeah, yeah. That's why some of us invest in stretch pants. But, but Psalm 24 and verse 3. Uh, David now asks this question. It's a very important question. Now, it's believed that this psalm was written at the point, if you remember in David's history, um, they found the Ark of the Lord, and they recovered the Ark of the Lord, and they were so excited, they stuck it on a cart. Do you remember that? And they carried it all wrong. They didn't plan and prepare and it was tilting on that cart, and Uzi went to touch it to stop it, and he was instantly killed, and David was upset. It put a halt to that whole parade. 
And the house, and it was put into, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the people's house that it was put in, but my memory's failing me. But it was put in a house for a while, and David gave up on it. But you know what David did? He studied and researched how that ark should have been carried. And the second time they did it correctly, as they were preparing, because they wanted to put the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion, was where they wanted to put it. And so it's believed that Psalm 24 was written around this event. So you can imagine that after researching what Scripture said, how to carry the ark, and making sure the right people were the ones carrying it in the right way, David is asking this question from the historical setting, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Now, if I could show you a picture of Jerusalem, and some of you have been there, uh, but I'll show you a picture. It's, it's uphill. You know, um, so whenever they went to worship on Mount Zion, which was God's chosen location, they had to go uphill to worship. And that's why it was an ascension. So from an historical standpoint, David is asking the question, who will be able to do this? And uh, yet we look at this and we can see in the Bible, Mount Zion is often referenced as heaven as well. It's kind of like Mount Zion, the earthly Jerusalem, is a picture of the heavenly Jerusalem. And often in writings, when we read of Jerusalem, I do believe we're meant to get the two-edged sword. So when David is saying, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? I think he's, he's even asking the more vital question of who's going to get in, who's going to be able to enter. Now, the standard of God is not lowered one iota in your salvation. Do you realize that? God fulfilled his law. He's a perfect God. Because he's a perfect God, he could not overlook my sin, nor yours. I, he couldn't just wink at it and pretend it didn't exist, but he had to deal with it. And the Bible says, God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But he dealt with my sin, and he dealt with your sin on his only son on the cross. He didn't overlook it. So this, and the reason being is, the only way that you and I are going to get in, Psalm 24 verse 4 says this, He who has clean hands, and a pure heart. If I was to ask you this question, do you have clean hands and a pure heart? What would you say? No. Now, as a believer, could you say that you do? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But I understand, because I feel the same way, Gloria, um, that in and of myself, no way I could not say this. But as a believer now, we can, because that's how God views us in his son, Jesus Christ. You know, Keith Green sings a beautiful song, um, nothing that you've done remains, only what you do for me. And he's basically saying, um, when I look at you, I see you only as holy. And... Um, you know, and obviously there's an aspect of our salvation that we are gifted the perfect righteousness of Christ. And so God views us through his son, Jesus Christ, as perfectly righteous, though the balance of that reality is we're still being sanctified. We, we can't claim that we have no sin because obviously um, as you live with yourself for one day, that day, you know, you find out that, no, I can't say I'm not without sin because I didn't do too well today, perhaps. But we're being sanctified. We're being purified. That's another process. We can say that we are perfect from a righteous position, but our condition is still under development. 
God is not unmindful of what we struggle with, what we grapple with. He's not unmindful of what, what does the Bible say about those who claim to be without sin? They're liars. They're liars. We deceive ourselves. Amen. So um, that's been an aspect. I guess that's been one sin I could say I've not committed <laughs> self-deception <laughs> because I can't ever go there and say I'm without sin because, you know, throughout the day, just, you know, just our attitude. And let me give you the standard that, that, that God has. He said, um, if you claim to be without sin, and, and I don't believe anyone in this room is making that claim, but there's been certain preachers recently who have made that claim who said, I have no sin. Does that preacher really know what sin really is? Because if that preacher is saying he's, never, he's not sinned, he has no sin, not only is it ridiculous, but we'll avoid that and for the sake of argumentation. But we'll say, we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The only way that that particular preacher who's on my mind right now, who's claiming that he has no sin, the only possibility would be that he loves God 24-7. Every second of the day, every moment of the day, his heart, mind, soul, and strength, Every single part of him is loving God. I don't know any human being that has achieved that. I've met people who have claimed to achieve that, but like you said, Butch, they're, they're liars. They, they can't do it. Well, they might be sinless in the eyes of their God. Their false God? But not the true God. No, they have a low view of God's holiness too because... There was a man by the name of Isaiah who probably thought he was pretty good. In fact, it may have been that he may have been working for the Lord prior to that heavenly encounter. And he said, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of unclean people. And he was touched by that coal so he could go and prophesy. And the nearer you get to God, the more you realize you are a sinner in that sense. Just sitting here thinking and reading that, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? It's interesting to me that God took Jesus outside the city where the cross was at, mm -hmm. and the only way for ascension is through the cross. It's outside in order to get into the holy place or up into the Zion. That's a good thought. Because the Bible even says, let us go outside of the city and let us bear his reproach. Yeah. Because there's something about the cross which causes reproach in, you know, in human beings. Uh, we don't like it, per se, because it completely nullifies all grounds of boasting. Kerry? What's reproach? Reproach is people speaking nasty, being, being bad towards you verbally because you're following Christ, you know, and... Bearing his reproach. Christ was reproached on the cross. Like he was spoken evil over. And sometimes I think we might be too. Because we try to follow Jesus. You know. And the Bible says that's actually a good thing. Even though it's not a pleasant. Ex thing. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't feel it's good. But it, no, but then you, at least you're being reproached for a good reason. Where, you know. If it's for our fault's sake, the scripture says we take it patiently and let people know, yep, I'm, he's still working on me, bear with me. Um, but he who has clean hands and a pure heart, there's only one who fits this perfectly, and that's Jesus Christ. So I do believe this psalm of ascension is really pointing us to Christ himself. And by the way, the righteousness you have is the righteousness of Christ himself. He gave you his righteousness because his righteousness is the only kind of righteousness that can stand before a perfect God, a holy God. And this is why the standard cannot be reduced. And very often, when I'm trying to be righteous in my own power, and uh, Butch or Norbert come along and they give me the verse, be ye therefore perfect, 
as your heavenly Father is perfect. I'm like, what are you talking about? And that whole scriptures like that, which we're going to look at here, um, remind us that we can't do this because God is, is a God of perfection. This is why we need a righteousness outside of our own, an imputed righteousness from Christ himself, which is a gift by his grace. And that's the only kind of righteousness that will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and will be squeaky clean. Because if you're going to stand there outside of Christ, and if I stand there outside of Christ, I'll be condemned. I won't make it because he's perfect. He cannot overlook my sin. Now we ask ourselves, what about sins that believers commit? Do believers commit sin? Yes. 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 Amen, they do. But the good news about that is the believer's sin does not condemn them to hell. Um, you know, I, I do believe that as Christians, we do have aspects of our nature that's wood, hay, and stubble, obviously, that will be burned up on that day. It won't go into heaven with us. It won't be allowed. There's no loss of salvation for the true believer, but there might be losses of, 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 of blessing, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, maybe we don't get to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's possible, you know. Um, but not loss of salvation. And that, that I believe, is the difference. So he, he, he who does not lift up his soul to what is false or idols and does not swear deceitfully, there's only one who, who really fits this description. Now, obviously, aspects of this, because through sanctification, we are being made more and more like Jesus. So these are qualities that should be seen in believers, even if it's not seen in perfection. You know, as we grow in Christ and as we grow in sanctification, we should be bearing something of the qualities of Jesus himself. In fact, that's what the Holy Spirit is wanting to produce in us. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is really Christ likeness. And so, yes, he wants to develop that, but... Let's, let's read this verse. You, therefore, must be perfect. Anyone perfect here? But you, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. It's talking about loving not just people who love you, but loving your enemies, loving people who hate you. But the reason why it's put so strongly it's to remind us that we, we, we can't do this. So there should be something in us as we read verses like this, that it pulls us away from ourselves and causes us to look to Christ. So the law is given as a, as a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. In other words... When, when I, as a Christian, I start getting a little bit self-righteous, I need the law to remind me that, Brian, you're not righteous. You can't live up to this. And by the way, that happens in my life. How about you? If I start thinking, hey, I'm doing pretty good here, and all of a sudden I get verses like this, I'm like, no, I still come up short. Now, here's another verse that really should hear those, Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So if righteousness was possible through human ambition, human achievement, human works, these scribes and Pharisees would have gotten in because these guys were the legalists of the legalists. They were the champion legalists, and they tried to obtain it through legalism. But Christ's righteousness exceeded the scribes and the Pharisees. Amen. Right? And that's, that's what we're trusting in. That's right. That's right. Go ahead, Jackson. Can you define the scribes and why they're mentioned? The scribes were the, were the teachers of the law. They were the ones who, scribing mm -hmm. the law... They were 
They were called to preserve and protect the laws of God. So like if you wanted to know where a certain verse was at, not, not that there were verses back then, but if you wanted to know where, you would go and ask a scribe, okay. and they would be able to tell you. But the other problem they had too, though, was they began to develop their own tradition, uh, traditions alongside Scripture itself. And if you remember, Jesus had to deal with that very often about ceremonial washings of their hands to make themselves clean. And so the scribes and the Pharisees were both guilty of coming up with man-made laws, man-made doctrines that competed alongside God's holy word. And as long as there's a church and as long as there's a people, we're always going to have that difficulty and that challenge of human beings wanting to raise something alongside God's word. Even prophecy can cover that too, that legalism. I'll give you a historical definition of scribe. It's Please do. Jewish record keeper, or later a professional theologian or jurist. Amen. That was just something I no, I like that. That's good. Thank you. That, that's really good. Um, so I, I have a note here because it's important for us to understand the balance. Because it would be possible, and sometimes this is what happens too, and Spurgeon reminded me of this unbalance that can take place sometimes that we can be so focused on justification that uh, in our human hearts, there are people who might use that as an excuse not to, not to do good works. You know what I'm saying? Um, Christians don't, don't do good works to get saved. We do good works because we are saved. You know, it's, a, it's an outworking of what we already have. And Spurgeon said this, he said, It is to be feared that many professors have perverted the doctrine of justification by faith in such a way as to treat good works with contempt. If so, they will receive everlasting contempt at the last great day. In other words, there are people who might lay claims to justification, but really, truly do not have it because it's not real in their life, you know, because... If we have been truly justified, then it's impossible for you and I to be justified without also being sanctified, you know. And so, yeah, just understanding the concept of justification does not necessarily get you in. And it doesn't excuse us to do bad things and, you know, to excuse good works. Um. Jesus put it this way. He says, let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, yeah, that, that's the balance. Now, I was hoping to finish this, but I may not finish it tonight. Do you have a bit more time, guys? I don't want to. Okay. Because um, I, I don't want to keep you longer than I should, but... He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, again, anything we have is given to us from the Lord. So when you as a Christian, you perform something good, it's not you. God provided you with the ability to do that good thing. So as we do good works as Christians, we're not looking at our good works and saying, well, that's what's going to save me. We look at the good works and say we do it because we've been saved and the good works we do perform, we give glory to God because he's the one that's given us the blessing to be able to operate. So he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So anything that we have has been given to us from God. What, does a, what, what can a man have? No, John the Baptist said this, a man can have nothing unless it be given to him from heaven. And that's true. Another Spurgeon quote here. It must not be supposed that the persons who are thus described by their inward and outward holiness are saved by the merit of their works. But their works are the evidences by which they are known. The present verse shows that in the saints, grace 
reigns and grace alone. So in other words, if you've received grace into your life, there will be a change in your life, a transformation, and you will not be the same. Now to finish the quote, God first gives us good works and then rewards us for them. Isn't that amazing? Even the good works we do are given to us by God himself. And we go and perform them, and he even rewards us for them. Do we really deserve a a reward? No, and and I love the way he puts that, because that just hits the nail on the head. Grace is not obscured by God's demand for holiness. No, it is not. Now, race through this. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. So what he's saying is, there are those who seek the Lord, and those who truly seek the Lord, there will be graces put upon them that make those people evident. And remember what I said, graces, qualities of character. Now, as we wrap up here and begin to wrap up, David is going into Jerusalem, but there's a higher Jerusalem here in mind, the ascension of Jesus Christ. When Jesus ascended into glory, the heavens were opened unto him. Glory, those ancient doors of heaven that shut off man from entering. He was the God-man who opened those doors for all redeemed humanity. And when it says, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Now, who is this king of glory? Well, we can say tonight, this king of glory is not David, it's Jesus Christ. He is the king of glory. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He's going up as a victor, as a conqueror. You could imagine the celebrations that must have went on as Jesus entered into heaven itself and he brought a train of the Old Testament saints with him. He emptied Abraham's bosom. There was a resurrection of those people. Some of those people were seen even around the ancient city of Jerusalem itself. And they were recognized for who they were. That, my friend, is a marvelous thing. So he has opened heaven for you and me. So it says, uh, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Could you imagine that? The king of glory going in. What, what did Jesus pray in John 17, 5? Father, glorify, thou me with, glorify me with you with the glory I had with you before the foundation of the earth. The angels must have been rejoicing at the readmission of the Son of God as he goes in and sits at the right hand of God the Father. You could imagine the great celebration that took place. And my friend, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because he's opened heaven for you and me. Jesus has opened heaven No more Abraham's bosom anymore. No more going down to paradise anymore. But we go into heaven itself because Christ has paved the way. So again, the question gets answered. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. The Lord of hosts, the God of angelic armies. But the Lord of hosts, the God who has everything under his jurisdiction, Everything's under his control. The sun, the moon, the stars, all human beings, all angelic beings, whether the elect or the evil spirits, they're all under his dominion. He has it all. It all belongs to him. Now, I'll close with this final passage, Hebrews 9.11. I will say this as we close. If you want to know more about the ascension of Jesus, read the book of Hebrews. It tells you everything you want to know about the ascension of Jesus. It's a book that really majors on that more than any other book in the Bible, um, the ascension of Christ. It goes beyond the resurrection and majors and focuses on what Christ is currently doing for you and I. 
Now we'll read this and wrap up. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So now we have a high priest who is performing his high priesthood, not on earth, although there was, when he offered himself, that was a part of it, but now he ever lives to represent you and me. It's not of this creation. It's of the, now he's in the heavens of heavens is where he's at. Now we read the final verse. He entered once, not repeatedly like the others. They had to go back and do it yearly. He did it once because once was enough. He entered once for all into the holy places or the holy of holies is a better translation not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, and notice the final outcome, thus securing, securing an eternal redemption, a never-ending redemption. It's good news, isn't it? So on this I'll close, but any thoughts, any questions as we wrap up here? Go ahead. I was sitting here thinking about Abraham. We often don't look at that as a work, but Abraham is called the father of righteousness because he obeyed God. The work that God did in Abraham was he just went. When he heard God speak, he went. Yeah. Not knowing where he was going, yeah. he became the father of... Uh, the, yeah, the father of all those who believe, right? So that, that was a work, and we covered yeah. that earlier about work, about obeying. And, uh, yeah. And so... That's the work, you know. It's not something we're busy trying to do all the time. It's just obeying yeah. God, whatever He says we do. And good work can be done in many ways throughout the day. But you know, I think it's interesting that Abraham, he heard God and he just took off. He went, not knowing even where he was headed. Amen. His journey was fueled by faith, wasn't it? Yeah. And our Christian life is meant to be fueled by the same the faith. But that was, with, God, but with, that was God's work by love. Amen. Faith is a gift. It's given. Well, let's... Uh, anything else before we close? Yeah, actually, I was going to share a little bit more about God's sovereignty in Romans uh, 9, 14 through 18, if I could read that. Sure. Uh, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God. Is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I, have, I will have compassion. Mm -hmm. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens those whom he desires. Sure. Amen. Shows God's sovereignty. It, it does. It's incredible, isn't it? God's sovereignty. Amen. That's wonderful. Yeah, even Pharaoh was raised up by God, and he was no God lover, <laughs> you know. And God, God, you know, um, he he didn't acknowledge God till he was forced to. But um, Amen. Well, let's close in prayer, then, shall we? Uh, Gloria, would you close in prayer for us tonight? Thank you. Yes, sir. We thank you that you show how much you love us, that you also show the true compassion. Yes. And that it's only through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can be blessed and enter into your presence. And we just pray that you would continue to draw us to you, open your word, and that we would join the Lord our God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.